Uh, our next speaker, ladies and gentlemen, uh, is interested in the semiotics of mathematics. He's a data specialist at his school, IS77. Put your hands together, ladies and gentlemen, for Adam Zaid. I am Adam, and I teach kids middle school math at IS77 in Ridgewood, Queens. And in the beginning, uh, when I started out 13 years ago, the, um, I, I wanted to make every single student in my room happy. And that was how I ran my room. Uh, were the kids happy? And was I making them happy? Now, <laughs> the deal is, though, is that maybe, uh, maybe not everyone's like this, but I am codependent. And um, because of uh, when I was growing up and I was in middle school, uh, the world wasn't exactly a safe place for me. And so I took on a whole bunch of coping behaviors and mechanisms to protect myself and to make the world a safe place for me. So I had to learn how to uh, control my world. And basically, from 1972 to 2012, I was thinking that I was in control of the world. Um, I, there were some great Yankee runs. S some amazing years on Wall Street, um, some not so great economies, and a lot of wars. And by the time I got into my classroom, uh, I found out that what I needed to do was to make people happy in order to control them. And what I found out was that with seventh graders, a great way to make them happy is ice cream parties. And since then, my classroom has always been a place where there's been lots of ice cream parties, um, and uh, always around math. Um, but we always had a lot of ice cream parties. In fact, if um, uh, Danielson had included in the rubric, I am highly effective at the ice cream party. Now, my sense of fairness and balance in my classroom comes from is everyone getting what they want at the ice cream party. And since I'm so obsessive about it, if I can mathematically prove that uh, everyone's happy at the ice cream party, then I can go home and go to sleep in peace, knowing that I made everybody happy, I'm safe, and I've controlled the day. <laughs> and that went great uh, for a while. And for about five, after five years of raising, successfully raising uh, seventh graders' blood sugar levels, um, I, I had a little problem. So let me tell you about a big problem that I ran into. It wasn't a little bit, it was a big problem. And the big problem was this. Uh, we had always uh, decided on the flavors and the toppings by a plurality election. So it's everybody gets one vote, and most votes wins. And um, sometimes the kids, and, and they would nominate the, the flavors they wanted. And if the kids were shy or slow, I would say, come on, you guys. Um, if you don't say what you want, it's going to be uh, pickles and anchovies. <laughs> so that one year, in 723, so there was a wise guy who was like the leader of this pack of boys. And he said, mister, I want pickles. OK. So to share the power, to uh, be fair, and to make everybody happy, I let the nomination stand, because no one's going to vote in pickles. Wrong. Uh, <laughs> 30 kids. Uh, the winner, uh, plurality winner, is pickles to fudge 9 to 7. Um, and I got a problem. Uh, the girls who hated those boys all freak out. I give in. I invoke the supreme ruler and emperor uh, rule, and clause, and we eat hot fudge. But this is a big problem for me, because now invoking that supreme ruler and emperor clause means I'm not making anybody happy. And uh, that makes me really uncomfortable. And on top of that, I can't use plurality as a, voting, a fair voting method anymore because it's really not going to make anybody happy. And plus, I could end up with somebody doing the pickles thing to me again. So, uh, and it gets even worse, because what I realize also is the majority is no better. Because really, in that class of 30, 21 kids uh, didn't want pickles. And 23 kids out of the 30, they really hadn't picked hot fudge either. So now I've got a big problem. That's messed up, mister. So, uh, <laughs> but fortunately, Right here at Math for America, upstairs from here, that summer, there's a workshop. And uh, there's a great workshop on uh, uh, voting and uh, voting methods, elections. And Eric Maskin, a uh, Nobel laureate, comes and he talks. And he, 
and he, and he teaches me a, uh, a method for uh, voting called the board account. And uh, basically, the board account is a rank order preference where you take all your uh, you rank from lowest to top. So the lowest uh, gets one point, and the next uh, to lowest gets two points, and the next to lowest gets three points, all the way to the top. So all you have to do in the end is count up all the points, and you can get yourself hot fudge as the board of winner. So that's looking good. And it's a consensus. Uh, you don't have to get all the top votes to win, you, as long as they're high ranking. So we're hoping that the pickles don't get the high rank votes, and, and we're good. But um, that's a consensus. It works great for university presidents, corporate heads, um, Heisman Trophy winners, uh, NBA and NHL uh, MVPs. Um, and uh, uh, it would work good for this. But it's not enough for me, because I've got to get everything. Uh, <laughs> and so there's another method called the Condorcet method, uh, named after another 18th century uh, French mathematician. And um, in the Condorcet method, you take those ranks, and now you pairwise compare them so that they go head to head. Uh, and who, whichever flavor, whichever candidate wins over everybody else all the time becomes the Condorcet winner. So it's what's called the true majority. So now I've got it figured it out. This is great. I'm going to have the kids in. We're going to teach them plurality, majority, Borda, and Condorcet. I'm going to run a little you know, sample with them so that they can pick out the uh, two methods that are going to decide for the, for the ice cream sundae party. Okay? They're going to do that. And invariably, they're going to choose the Borda and the Condorcet method. So everything is going to be great. And it's going great until the year comes when hot fudge wins the Borda and whipped cream wins the uh, Condorcet, which can happen, and it did. <laughs> So now my life is completely unmanageable. <laughs> so Jeffrey, uh, one of my seventh graders, figures it out for me. But let me introduce you to Jeffrey. Okay, Jeffrey's 12. In sixth grade, he scored a one on the sixth grade New York State math test. He randomly does homeworks. Um, and he still is trying to figure out what period he has math and ELA. It's just all. <laughs> but Jeffrey and, comes out of nowhere with this. And he says, here are the rules, he says, for a fair election. He says, first off, you got to have a consensus. If everybody wants whipped cream, you can't have hot fudge. He says, all voters are counted equally in his own way. He says all candidates are treated equally. He says the bottom ones, their outcome can't affect the top. Okay, And then he says, it's got to be a clear winner. It has to be a decisive victory. And then he quietly says to me, Mr. Zabe, I don't think there is any one voting method that can satisfy all those things. Well, that was kind of interesting because Eric Maskin had talked to us about Arrow's impossibility theorem. And his teacher, another Nobel laureate, Ken Arrow, had basically said, those are, the, those are the criteria for a fair election. No one voting method can do all those things. So it took Jeffrey, a low achieving seventh grader from Queens, and two Nobel laureates to get me to accept. <laughs> I wasn't going to reach every kid who came into my room. I wasn't going to be a great teacher to every kid who came into my room. I wasn't going to be able to make everybody happy. There is no perfect ice cream party. Thank you.